you unmute house chair unmute eh mm-hmm. good afternoon comrade good afternoon minister good afternoon everybody on the platform afternoon chairperson yes no good luck for the day Everyone, yes, thank you. And house chair, don't give us trouble, ne? you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, why is there I, think, I think I think I should be saying that to you rather <laughs> than you saying it to me. <laughs> hey, why is the house chair intimidated now? Oh, DP, yes. <laughs> Yeah. Mom Candy. Hi, this is. Hi, good afternoon. So my room mute. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Lisa, you saw me, Uba no Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, Quella Pezu, Uquella Pez Guanto, no Mona Lis. Hey, not Mona Lisa, Yana Lisa. Whatever, Chini, Aua, yes, you are out of office. Vala, mute, are you mute? A over, a over, a over. What have I done? Tis all, tis all, tis all, Kunga, and Abba. 
Yeke lumona lise mitingi nyetu wa sale. Tokunga wena hapa. Ta, ta uvala hii missions. Sizo mbongu zvala uzvula nini. <laughs> Valani nonke. Valani nonke. <laughs> Yee. Hai. Yeah. Yee. Yeah. Yee. 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 Thank you, uh, honorable members. Uh, I want to welcome all the members who have logged into the mini plenary session. Uh, let's start with an opportunity for a silent prayer or meditation. Thank you, honorable members. Before we proceed, I would like to remind you that the virtual mini plenary uh, is deemed to be in the precinct of parliament and constitute a meeting of the National Assembly for debating purposes only. In addition to the rules of the virtual sittings, the rules of the National Assembly including the rules of debate shall apply. Members uh, enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in the sitting of the National Assembly. Members should equally note that anything said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been said to the house and may be ruled upon. Uh, all members who have logged in shall be considered to be present and are requested to mute their microphones and only unmute when recognized to speak. This is because the mics are very sensitive and will pick up noise which might disturb the attention of other members when recognized to speak please unmute your microphone and connect your video. Members may make uh, use of the icons on the bar at the bottom of their screens, which is an option that allows a member to put up his or her hand to raise points of order. The secretariat will assist in alerting the chairperson to members requesting to speak. When using the virtual system, members are urged to refrain or desist from unnecessary points of order or interjections. We shall now proceed honorable members to the order, which is debate, on vote six, international relations and corporations, appropriation bill. I will now invite the honorable, the minister, honorable minister Pando to lead the debates. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable chairperson. Honorable Chairperson, members of the Executive, Honorable Members and guests joining us today. Thank you very much for this opportunity to lead the debate on vote six. We return to Parliament for this budget vote debate following an unexpectedly tumultuous financial year. While we have made every effort to act on the priorities we signaled in 2019, much of our work had to be adjusted to focus on supporting government in the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. Adjustments also had to be made due to significant budget cuts. 2020-21 was our African Union chairship year, and we had plans to advance our policy agenda of a better Africa and a better world. The key focus for 2020 was the priority of silencing the guns in Africa and advancing the economic participation of women. 
we were also committed to ensuring implementation of all the steps necessary to give effect to the African Free Trade Area Agreement and further implementation of the APRM. Our budget for 2020, 21 was 6 billion 850 million 179,000 as announced in April 2020. It was reduced to 6 billion 314 million 968,000. The Durco budget for 2021 22 was announced as 7 billion 38 million 531,000 in the 2021 budget speech and was finally reduced to 6 billion 452 million 372,000 for this financial year. The funding pressures we continue to experience have caused severe cutbacks in key areas, low levels of economic growth and declining investment in our country and on the continent are a severe constraint on our international ambitions. South Africa is fortunate to have a dedicated body of Durko men and women who work very hard to ensure that we do achieve our objectives and who tolerate significant sacrifices to ensure we succeed. We have done even more to focus missions overseas on economic diplomacy, as we must secure more jobs more jobs and growth. Chair, we observe the positive character of DERCA officials in the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Our consular services branch and all our missions ensured the successful repatriation of thousands of South Africans stranded overseas. The department's efforts benefited from the support of portfolio committee members and from the general public. I wish to thank all who played a role in the repatriation efforts. With respect to our AU chairship, President Ramaphosa gave sterling leadership to the Bureau, the AU Commission and our continent. The African Union chair ensured a coordinated African response to the pandemic, helped develop an Africa strategy and secured the support of African leaders through an open consultative approach agreement that Africa should use its own resources to support the African Centers of Disease Control as the scientific advisor on our pandemic response was a critical factor in Africa addressing the pandemic's effects. Furthermore, the decision of the chair to create an African medicines platform as a web-based platform for equal access to health equipment treatment and diagnostics was innovative and impactful. The role of the chair went beyond the health response and focused on the economic impact of the COVID virus. The economic envoys appointed by the African Union chair and the commission engaged financial institutions and government leaders to secure debt relief and debt standstill for indebted African countries. So they focus on the pandemic and have liquidity for socioeconomic recovery. We've not yet secured new funding sources to provide investment for growth on the continent. We continue to engage multilateral financial institutions to provide such new funding and not more debt loans as they prefer. While focusing on our COVID-19 response, much was done to continue our engagements with the globe including support to the president's annual investment conference. The objective of securing recovery funding continues to be pursued by President Ramaphosa and other African leaders. The Financing Africa Summit in Paris this week focused on the urgent need for the International Monetary Fund to finalize the matter of special drawing rights and the issue of expanded vaccine production as well as the call for the temporary waiver by the WTO of the TRIPS regulations as part of a global response to the pandemic. Honorable members, even in the worst effects of the pandemic, the one feature that was prominently confirmed 
was the vital importance of multilateralism in global collaboration. Faith was restored in multilateral institutions that had been confronting negativity for several years. COVID-19 revived and affirmed global cooperation. Multilateral and regional bodies enjoyed a long denied prominence and leadership. This reality has assisted our long held belief that multilateral institutions matter and are a more inclusive and equitable global option for managing global affairs. We have continued to engage in the UN and to uphold the rights of the people of Palestine to statehood, those of Western Sahara to self-determination, as well as the need for the UN and the AU to assist Africa to finally achieve continent-wide peace and focus on development. Our 2019-20 annual report and that of 2020-21 show the progress we've made in meeting our goals and objectives. They show that while our strength is diminished by inadequate resources, we continue to put punch above our weight in international cooperation. We will seek even greater impact in 2021-22. We will do more to support Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt to negotiate an agreement on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. We will also work closely with South Sudan and Libya to promote and support post-conflict reconstruction. And much more will be done to achieve the gender agenda mandated by the AU adoption of 2020-2030 as the decade of the financial inclusion of women in Africa. Our response to the impact of COVID-19 resonates strongly with the legacy we have inherited from Mama Charlotte McLege. She was a woman who believed that it is possible to build back better. In the unquenchable spirit of this great woman of Africa, it is imperative that we focus this year on building back better. The negative impact of COVID-19 has clear directives for our future agenda. We will continue to promote the mainstreaming of gender perspectives in all our contributions in the UN and the African Union. Working closely with the African Union Special Envoy on Gender and the Commission for Peace and Security, we will consult women leaders in post-conflict areas and work with them to ensure their contribution to reconstruction and development in their countries. We are very pleased to be serving in the UN Peace Building Commission for 21-22, as this will help us contribute toward the maintenance of international peace and security, just as we did during our term in the UNSC. Peace and security are extremely fragile or absent in many parts of the globe. The recent vicious attacks by Israel on Palestinian people and the apartheid style forced removal of Palestinians from their homes is clear absence, evidence of the absence of peace and security. Sadly, we all watched as Palestinians suffered more and more brutally greater effort must be exerted to achieve peace in the Middle East. Powerful nations must accept that we all depend on each other, and even the most powerful will not achieve peace and security through unilateral actions and neglect of the poor, the oppressed, and marginalized. We call on the United Nations and Middle Eastern countries to be more resolute in pursuing freedom for the people of Palestine. Charlotte Matege was a bold agent of change. We must be as bold and determined in seeking concrete practical reform of the UN Security Council. I am pleased that early steps toward text-based negotiations are in motion in the United Nations. There is significant resistance, honorable members, to changing the status quo. And we must continue to insist that change is urgently necessary. We need a representative and 21st century relevant Security Council responsive to today's challenges. There were 51 member states in 1945. We have grown to 193 member states 
yet the most important mechanism of the UN remains untransformed. Building back better also means we should utilize our global cooperation to secure Africa's ability to effectively respond to complex challenges, such as a global pandemic. We must increase our research and innovation capacity and be more ready to rely on our ingenuity, our products, and our institutions in future. Charlotte Maclege and all our great heroes and heroines believed in our innate abilities. Let us use them to free ourselves from post-colonial dependency. Honorable members, Africa lies at the heart of our international agenda. We firmly believe we should ensure Pan-African ability to determine our affairs and shape Africa's future. We've begun a process of reviewing our Africa strategy so that we respond to the new realities of the continent through an approach that is consistent with our agenda 2063 of the Africa we want. We have comparative advantages as South Africa that can support and promote increased African success. We intend to build strategic partnerships and political alliances in a far more rigorous manner. We will strengthen bilateral relations and cooperation and build strategic partnerships with clear goals and objectives. We plan to begin in Southern Africa and to ensure that SADC plans are reinforced and concretely implemented. Mama Matlega did not limit her world to South Africa. And as with our dialogue series icon, Mama Shope, she was a remarkable internationalist. This is one of the reasons why we are robustly strengthening our trade cooperation and people exchanges with Southeast Asia. We are thrilled that our portfolio committee recognized the exciting opportunities in the ASEAN, and we thank the chairperson for her leadership in ensuring that our entry into the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation of ASEAN was supported by Parliament. Chairperson in August, South Africa will assume chair of the SADC organ on politics, peace, and security. The organ has been deliberating on the extremist attacks in Mozambique. Ministers of the organ have developed SADC proposals for support to Mozambique that we hope will soon be adopted at the end of this month by the heads of state in an organ summit. 2020, was our second year as a non-permanent member of the Security Council of the UN. The feedback we received indicates that the role of South Africa in the Council was deeply appreciated due to South Africa's principal position on issues on the Council's agenda. Our relatively independent position, together with a compelling commitment to peaceful resolution of disputes and a fair and balanced approach in engaging with member states allowed South Africa to play a bridge building role in a divided Security Council. During our tenure, we continued to advance UN and AU cooperation on peace and security matters, particularly with reference to Libya, the Sahel region, and the transitional process in South Sudan. We note with hope the positive progress in Libya and further actions on the comprehensive agreement in South Sudan. Durka will remain closely attentive to support for post-conflict reconstruction in South Sudan, and we are in constant contact with the government there. We also welcome the efforts by various organizations in South Africa to assist Sudan in their transition and constitution-making processes. Our president has also worked closely with G20 countries, with our BRICS partners, and the EU to continue supporting South Africa and Africa in implementing our international agenda. We also directed efforts at addressing inadequacies in our own department. We've adopted an audit action plan whose intention is to support DERCO in achieving improved audit outcomes. We have a lot to do before we attain a full clean audit, but progress is being made. Our skills need enhancement in the finance division, and we must make changes as has been indicated 
by various portfolio committee reports in our parliament. Action has also been taken following reports on the New York land project. We have confirmed that we will act when public resources are not used according to policy and regulatory requirements. Chairperson, the cuts I referred to in budget resulted in changes in our operations. This and the continued economic impact of COVID-19 led us to review South Africa's diplomatic footprint globally in an effort to reduce costs while ensuring a presence throughout the world we are in the process of closing 10 of our 122 missions during the course of this year. The missions in closest geographic proximity will provide diplomatic cons and consular services to countries that no longer host our missions. We plan to use improved IT services to ensure efficient consular support to our citizens who live in those countries. We also intend to appoint honorary consuls to enable us to continue to have a presence and to uphold established relations. I have been most grateful for the understanding shown by my foreign minister colleagues in all these difficult actions. In addition to reducing our mission footprint, we have made concrete progress toward finalizing our organizational structure. We plan to have a department structure that does not cause us to exceed our budget allocation while also ensuring we attract and retain talent within DERCO. The continuing decline in our compensation of employees budget has been a challenge for DERCO, and I'm hopeful we will be able to resolve this particular challenge. I do believe improved allocations need to be considered for our international work, but I'm fully appreciative of the constraints to growth that we all need to overcome together. It is due to the need to support the economic ambitions of our government that we have directed increased attention to the promotion of economic diplomacy through all our missions. We are also working hard for increased trade opportunities from our major trading partners. China is one of our most significant trading partners. Honorable Chair and Honorable Members would be aware that our two-way trade with Asia and the Middle East region has grown from 45 billion rands in 1990 to a staggering 984 billion rands in 2020. COVID-19 caused a contraction of 1.6% in our trade with Asia and the Middle East. But importantly, even in this time, our trade with China continued to expand. In 2019, two-way trade with China stood at 413 billion rands and grew to 437 billion rands in 2020. The agriculture sector has led this growth. This has resulted in more jobs, more small and medium-sized business growth, more small commercial farmers, and enhanced trade exchanges. Most pleasing is that trade is beginning to be a surplus gain for our exporters with an increasing number of countries in that region. Added to this welcome progress are the improved trade figures for South Africa in the ASEAN region. In 2020, two-way trade between South Africa and East Asia grew to 119 billion rands. I've asked our missions in that region to help identify increased opportunities in the massive halal market and in citrus and other commodities. The statistics on current trade indicate significant growth in the ASEAN region, a fast-growing region with a GDP of over $3.1 trillion, and we want more of that, and a market of over 650 million people. This evidence of progress links well with our progress in BRICS, especially in the work of the New Development Bank. Charlotte Matlega was a team player who sought to benefit all in her circle. She did not shy away from a challenge as shown by the support to her 
when she and her choir were stranded in the United States of America. Similarly, we have been steadfast advocates of a vibrant, active, collaborative BRICS. We are hopeful of expanded bank membership this year and fully appreciate the $2 billion we secured from the bank to assist us in our response to COVID-19. We also secured a billion dollars for our non-toll road infrastructure program in 2020. Our trilateral IPSA forum with India and Brazil has been a glowing example of a new blueprint for South-South cooperation. Since its inception in 2005, the IPSA Fund for Poverty and Hunger Alleviation supported over 30 development projects in 22 countries of the Global South to the value of $32 million. In 2020, the fund approved new development projects in several African countries, including Senegal, the DRC Benin, Uganda, Sudan, Mali, Niger, and Eswatini. Chairperson, our focus in international relations includes our promotion of the values and ethos of our constitution through advocating for human dignity, democracy, and equality. We continue to stand in full solidarity with the people of Palestine and will work even harder to persuade the African Union and the United Nations to robustly pursue freedom for the people of Palestine. The cruel bombings and killings of the innocent that we witnessed in the past two weeks are a sad testimony of the cruel impunity the world has granted to Israel. The international community must stop this impunity. South Africa should support the ICC in the planned investigation of the abuse of human rights by the Israeli government. We hope sanctions and other measures to show the world's offense at this brutality will soon be evident. The people of Cuba also continue to be victims of an unwarranted blockade that should be finally ended by the new US administration. We will continue to support Cuba and work closely with that solid friend of South Africa. A better Africa continues to be a key foreign policy imperative. Working closely with trade, industry, and competition, we will support implementation of the Free Trade Area Agreement. We must do everything possible to ensure its successful implementation. For many African countries, free trade means more productive capacity, more economic infrastructure, and new trade opportunities. Our department has supported countries that have held elections in 2020 providing funding for expertise via the IEC or relevant non-government partners. The support to Central African Republic supported an election that many judged as free and fair. While pursuing our African agenda vigorously, we will also build on the excellent trade relations with the United States of America, the European Union, member states, and the United Kingdom. These are significant trading partners for South Africa, and we plan to grow the trade, people, and cultural links through our embassies. Several ambassadors have called on us to do more on cultural diplomacy. I'm told that Black Coffee, DJ Black Coffee, can fill Wembley Stadium and profile South Africa. But when he performs overseas, there's insufficient association with his South African identity. We have great talent in our country and we must mount international cultural events to show our diversity of talents worldwide. This is an area I hope to focus on more as we begin to refocus our foreign activities. Finally, honorable members, I wish to assure you that we are working hard to build back better as Charlotte McClague expected us to. We must provide skills opportunities to young people, enhance our innovation and digital and capabilities so that we rank with the best among the world and build a South Africa, Africa and world that will be of service to humanity. I thank you, Chairperson and Honorable Members. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. 
Uh, we proceed now to the ANC and invite the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on International Relations and Corporations, the Honorable Mahambe Sala. Um, thank you uh, very much, uh, House uh, Chairperson, um, Minister, Deputy Ministers, Members of Parliament and members of the Portfolio Committee on International Relations and Cooperation. The self-determination for the people of Palestine is now more urgent than ever. The flagrant impunity and total disregard of lives of Palestini Palestinians by Israel, especially women and children, must be condemned with contempt. If what we have witnessed in the last 10 days is not tantamount to apartheid, then nothing will ever be. We associate ourselves with the statement by President Ramaphosa in support of the Palestinian people. We call for the right to self-determination for the people of Palestine and the end to the Israel bombardment uh, of Gaza. I will now uh, turn into the APP. Based on the recent briefing of the department, I must hasten to acknowledge that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about challenges for the department in carrying out international work. Digital diplomacy is the new normal. The department has to adapt and ensure the implementation of its digital strategy. Upon its assumption of duty into parliament, this committee prioritized the promulgation of the Foreign Services Act 2019. It is our concern that despite that, the act has not entered into force yet. To us, this must be a priority, a minister, because there has never been a legislation mm -hmm. that provides for management and administration of foreign service. On the other hand, the revival of the Partnership for Development Bill intended to repeal the current ARF Act is long overdue. The governing party, the ANC, has long directed that there should be a paradigm shift towards development a partnership approach as opposed to a donor recipient setup. To this end, SADPA should have already been oper in operational or operationalized. It has come to our attention that the department is considering many options as a means of containing the concentration of employees within the setup ceiling, including the reduction of missions. We know that about 11 missions are earmarked for closure. In this regard, a political view has been expressed by the committee that the reduction of missions should not impact on the central position of Africa in the country's foreign policy principles. The department should also consider acquiring properties abroad as opposed to renting to save costs. Rentals are also a cost driver on the budget of the department and missions abroad. Honorable Minister, the department should continue dedicating efforts for regional integration based on economic development through monitored implementation of South Africa's obligation to SADC and the African Union and contribute to the operationalization of agenda of identified agenda 2063 flagship project. Departments should approach its work with a mindset that foreign policy is informed and shaped by domestic policies. The department should therefore strengthen focus on economic diplomacy through structured bilateral mechanisms as the important vehicle of the department for contributing to the economic reconstruction and recovery plan presented by President Cyril Ramaphosa to the joint sitting of parliament on the 15th of October, 2020. To achieve this, we expect the department to aim at having more foreign direct investment into South Africa and Africa, finding access for our products to foreign markets, improving investor confidence and increasing tourism arrival to South Africa. The review of structured bilateral mechanisms therefore becomes very urgent to enable the department to use this tool to address domestic challenges. The advancement of African interest remains pivotal to South Africa's foreign policy. In pursuit of this country's pan-Africanist vision of unity, 
solidarity and common African destiny, we hope for harmonized policies between relevant departments to ensure that South Africa benefits from the creation of the African continent free trade. The operationalization of the border management authority becomes crucial in this regard. Harmonization of policies is indeed or is needed to ensure that Bait Bridge becomes a focal point to connect South Africa to the rest of the continent in the north. The department should also continue to focus on the promotion of greater peace, security and stability on the continent. It is the committee's political view that South Africa should remain committed to multilateralism as one of the principles underpinning South Africa's foreign policy. We continue to advocate for the reform of global governance institutions and the department should keep this agenda item alive for the democratization of the UN system, especially the UN Security Council. Compliance with international reporting obligations is crucial and such reports should be tabled in parliament for a political view before being opened for international scrutiny. As a committee, we have oversight interest that the department should continue to advocate mutual beneficial South to South cooperations and also continue alliances with the countries of the North in support for President's investment initiative. Particularly, particular focus rather should be on the sectors that promote industrialization and increase beneficiation and those that can transform South Africa's economy. We recommend the department for handling, we commend the department for handling the procurement of PPEs properly and did not fall prey to tender corruption. The pandemic has opened up increased need for consular services by South Africans abroad. We again applaud the work of the department and missions abroad in this regard since the advent of the pandemic. As parting shot, the minister will recall that we had engagements recently regarding the New York projects, whereby the committee was not, not fully informed on the consequence management to the implicated officials. It is disheartening to observe how this matter was handled despite the oversight recommendations of the committee and the AG's report on the subject. We must reiterate that it is not in the interest of the committee to intervene in the international, in the internal matters of the department, but the oversight role of parliament must be taken serious. I therefore thank you, honourable member, and the ANC supports the budget vote. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, honourable member. We move now to the DA, and uh, we welcome honourable Berkman. Thank you. I'd like to say that we call for peace and calm in the Middle East. We, play a, we place a value on all lives, and one life for injury is one too many. The DA reiterates its call for a two-state solution. Diplomacy helps countries to build relationships that could assist in the advancement of technology, the stimulation of trade, and to keep the peace. Unfortunately, South Africa dithers in clarity between its internal culture and its external policies. When it comes to being the champion of human rights, it would be more credible and appreciated if South Africa was more consistent. In Africa, we fight for countries like Western Sahara, but we remain silent on our neighbor Zimbabwe or in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Cameroon. We fight for countries outside, but remain silent on the treatments of the Rohingyans and the Yugos. This could leave many people wondering, what is it that is driving the foreign affairs of South Africa? Is it blind loyalty? Is it a policy that continues to stay historic and refuses to look into the future? At one stage, we could have set our relationship with BRICS, but that seems to have simmered somewhat. Maybe someone finally realized that we were heading for our next, uh, our next borrow of colonization. It just goes to show that South Africa has been spending millions upon millions in membership to all those organizations. And yet when it comes to COVID at all, it seemed we learned who our real friends were. By now we should know that some of these organizations are just not worth belonging to and that our monies could be better spent domestically. We should also prioritize our delegations accordingly, saving our best for the best. With regards to Durko, 
We have a DG that has now apparently been suspended for the New York shenanigans. But I remember a few weeks ago, the minister going to great lengths to point out that she never said that the DG was suspended for that reason. And then threw her spokesperson under the bus for daring to allegedly say that it was that reason. The CFO, who was there at the time, has been suspended. But obviously, when your subordinates are investigating you and having to find against you, you're pretty safe. And there are no surprises as to why the CFO is still there. Durko has now become a Hollywood blockbuster with a whole lot of actors, an acting DG, an acting CFO. But what we need are people that are going to act in the best interests of the public and start servicing the public at our missions abroad. We have the second biggest footprint, but we are beholden to the services of home affairs. When they decide to process passports, IDs, and other documents, is a, thumb, is a thumb suck guess on its own. But when Durko finally get the diplomatic bags delivered, is another mystery, all on its own. In the end, we have these lovely looking officers with tired and battered looking officials that can only really offer our citizens excuses and half baked smiles. When will we have a joint committee meeting in the interests of our citizens abroad? Some people will come here and talk about the punishment of closing embassies and will forget how sore they felt when they thought China had recalled their ambassador, how the Democratic Alliance has been calling for the decreasing of our footprint and consulates in areas where it does not make any sense, cost, technology, or trade-wise. Uh, honorable, honorable Bergman, yes. just a minute. I, I see a hand here from the Honorable Member Babo. Honorable Babo? Hochi, I wanted to check whether the member is prepared to take a question on his pro-Israel right-wing views. Honorable member. I don't think prepared? the honorable member, I don't think the honorable member was listening. It was a very balanced view, but no, I'm not prepared to take a question. He wasn't listening. It okay. should be something that is fed through the oversight committee for comments and input before it became a decision. Unfortunately, with our current track record, we are bound to close the embassies that are beneficial to trade and technology or those that are visa intensive, causing more burden to the citizens of our countries in terms of job losses, lack of tourism, and in trade. You cannot expect much more from a country when around 75% of our heads of missions are political appointees. Most of our officials in Durko are career diplomats, and they head up a lot of our functions. And these require specializations that could help South Africa protect itself from, our, from ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable McPherson, you have your hand up. Thanks, Chair. I didn't want to disturb the Honorable Member but while he was on the floor, but really, if the Honorable Popol wants to please, uh, you know, ask silly questions, he must do them in terms of the rules Honourable. and not do them to try and make uh, cast aspersion on members. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Let's proceed to the EFF. We have uh, Honorable Msani. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, we are having this debate at a very critical moment for world peace. The apartheid and criminal state of Israel is bombing and killing Palestinian women and children as we speak. Beyond the usual rhetoric, condemning the criminal state of Israel and the murderous conduct of Benjamin Netanyahu, the country has not done anything that will materially show our support to the people of Palestine. The UNSC met a few days ago in a meeting that was requested by China in order to debate the killings of Palestinians by the apartheid state of Israel. All African leaders have chosen to remain absolutely silent in this matter. South Africa is continuously making meaningless noise here in the country, but continue to house Israel within our borders and on our land. Minister, is there something that we are not aware of? Is South Africa owing its allegiance to the apartheid state of Israel. Why are you steadfast on keeping the embassy of these murderers in our country? 
Kanti, what does having a mission or embassy in a country truly mean? We want the South African government to recall our ambassador to Israel and close the Israeli embassy here for good. Well, closer to home, we have allowed our neighbor in Mozambique to be infiltrated by terrorists. And we have folded our arms in the growing security and humanitarian disaster in Mozambique. A, a strategic meeting that should have taken place, the Sadek Troika Summit, which was meant to bring assistance in saving lives of the people of Mozambique, had to be canceled as the president of South Africa was busy answering to allegations of state capture. How, how is the country and the African continent meant to have hope of a better life when their leaders have demons that they need to rid themselves of? We need to act to stop the rapid increase of terrorism in Mozambique because inevitably this will spill over to this country. South Africa has been privileged to lead the African continent in many strategic bodies, such as being the president of the UNSC in December 2020, the AU chairmanship in 2020, and also being a non-permanent member of the UNSC for more than three terms. That's just mentioning a few. However, South Africa has not advocated for any structural changes to these important bodies. The UNSC remains unreformed. The African Union has not met any of its Agenda 2063 targets. Insurgencies and political instabilities continue to rise with no tangible solution in place. African states continue to rely on private military security run by apartheid agents and the US AFRICOM. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement will remain in its implementation stage and not be fully implemented for many years to come. This is because the AU suffers from institutional and capacity deficit like that of the APSC. Africa is always calling on private military security instead of establishing a permanent African Defense Force to replace the African standby force that was established in terms of Article 13 of the protocol of relating to the establishment of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. This month is celebrated as Africa Month across the continent. This year marks 58 years since the formation of the Organization of African Unity. The founding fathers of independent African states wanted to unite the continent. They knew then, as we know now, that Africa will never prosper as long as we are divided. They knew then, as we know now, that a single prosperous country among a sea of suffering in the continent will never taste true freedom unless all African countries are free, prosperous and free of conflict. This is only possible through a united continent under a single federal government with a centrally planned economy, a single defense force, a single reserve bank, and an independent judiciary. You have betrayed this ideal. You even betrayed the limited quasi pan African rhetoric espoused by Tabombeg. Your approach to matters of the continent and the world at large is driven by no single guiding vision. You, you just move along whatever direction the wind takes you. Well, the EFF rejects this budget. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Ms. Musane. Uh, as we proceed and call on the IFP and welcome the Honorable Shengwa. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable House Chairperson and Honorable Members. At the outset, on behalf of the IFP, let me thank the Foreign Services officials across the world who have kept the South African flame burning in a very difficult time brought about by COVID-19. During this time, we have also seen the domestic, regional and international inequalities which have beset the world forcing us to reimagine how we interact politically, socially, and economically. 
A key driver to this new change is, of course, DECO, which itself is still trying to press the reset button on its own operations. Amongst other things, the failure to implement the Foreign Services Bill is a systematic problem. And so we are also calling again that the rationalization of the foreign missions, which is currently an exercise underway, to be done with the necessary urgency as a cost-cutting exercise but without compromising the country's strategic and diplomatic obligations regionally and internationally. Speaking about the global inequalities and their coping at the central position of these changes, the minister and the president have recently returned from France from another summit. What we have seen and evidenced was yet another country inviting a continent for economic matters. It was nothing short of being naughty schoolboys being filed into the headmaster's office. That should tell us just how far behind Africa is. The New York building scandal exists as a blot on the hopes of the department to achieve a clean audit. And the IFP fundamentally believes that the implementation of the portfolio committee's recommendations in this regard should be followed. Honorable House Chairperson, we meet at a time of heightened and global instability and an escalation of violence in the Middle East, which we condemn in the strongest possible terms. We call for a peaceful resolution to the challenges that beset Israel and Palestine. We call for a ceasefire and we call for a return to the negotiating table to save lives. The situation as it stands is untenable. In the same vein, Honorable House Chairperson, we once again draw the attention of this House to the key question of consistency, particularly on issues of human rights. The One China policy exists as an albatross on the South African diplomatic outlook as the people of Taiwan, Hong Kong and Tibet and many around the world continue to want to have their own independence and self-determination free of the clutches of China. This is something which we must take with the seriousness that it deserves. Honorable House Chairperson, bring it closer to home. There is a collapse and dysfunctionality of the domestic and regional intelligence services as evidenced by the terror attacks which we witnessed in Mozambique, notwithstanding the fact that warnings in this regard had been given to South Africa and the region. And yet again, we are playing a game of catch up to the very advanced terrorist networks which beset the global community. Honorable House Chairperson, for South Africa to prosper on the international stage, we need to begin doing, doing things right here at home as well. The minister speaks about budget cuts, which of course have happened. However, if you don't want those budget cuts, we need economic growth and economic development so that we can be able to pull together the necessary economic resources to fund our international initiatives. Therefore, it is important that we find a healthy balance between our domestic country responsibilities and obligations and our international outlook of a South Africa that plays a pivotal role in the global community. All these things said, Honorable House Chairperson, we do need to reimagine how we do things for the greater good. And that begins with doing things right here at home. Charity begins at home if we want to be impactful on the global stage. Honorable House Chairperson, I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Shengwa. As we proceed, we welcome the FF Plus, Honorable Dr. Mulder. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister and members, the COVID pandemic will have an effect on South Africa and all South Africans for a very long time to come. The question is what role could and should the Department of International Relations and Cooperation play in assisting us to get through this new reality? It is good to have key priority areas for the next five years, such as enhancing the African agenda and sustainable development, participating in the global system of governance, However, this should not and cannot be our main focus. These priorities are nice to have, but not things we can, can't do without. Our main focus should be on what is of immediate importance and without which all other priority areas will become completely irrelevant. 
the Department of International Relations and Cooperation should focus in totality how the department can contribute to the economic recovery and reconstruction plan for South Africa to do what? To increase foreign direct investment, to improve South Africa's access to foreign markets, to contribute to increased tourism arrivals in South Africa, and to improve investor confidence. Without that, with our huge debt, we are dead in the water. In my limited time, I would like to touch on a few aspects. Honorable Minister, the department can't afford to spend almost one billion on rentals per annum. This is more than 16% of the total budget. I know that there's a process to scale down on our number of missions abroad, but we just have to go much further. Rather a much smaller but effective international footprint in those places that really matter. Then Honorable Minister, I would like to come to the embarrassing case of advocate David Nkosi. Honorable Minister, a letter was sent to you regarding the news in March, 2021, that the South African diplomat left the apartment he occupied in Vienna in such a damaged state that the estimated cost to repair and restore amounts to around 715,000 Rand. According to the owner of the apartment, Mr. Carl Weedy, when a course he moved out in August 2020, all the electrical appliances in the kitchen were destroyed and all the valuable cutlery was missing. There were no glasses left, the fridge and the microwave was destroyed, the window frames and door frames were damaged, the sink and bath and toilets were stained and walls and floors were dirty, stained with black soot and the place was infested with cockroaches. This behavior by a South African diplomat is totally unacceptable and taxpayers should not be burdened with paying for these damages. The department has allegedly launched an investigation to these allegations. The spokesperson from the department said the matter was receiving urgent attention and an investigation is underway, which will also determine liability. Honorable Minister, it is disgusting and a huge embarrassment for all South Africans when a person representing us abroad behave in this manner. It is not good enough for the department if the department is going to pay for the damages. The department will pay with taxpayers' hard-earned money. No, we insist that the culprit at the Kittenkosi personally pay for each and every cent. That all relevant monies be recovered from him, even if private prosecution may be necessary. Lastly, Honourable Chairperson, I would like to come to the question of Israel and Palestine. And it's quite clear that the Minister, as well as the ANC members, and I know the NFP will do the same and, and Al Jamal will do the same, today clearly uh, uh, gives their, their solidarity and they, they demonstrate their solidarity with the Palestinians and Hamas. Minister, you said we all watched the vicious attacks by Israel on Palestine. And then you said we stand in full support of Palestine. But Honorable Minister, you did not say one single word about the fact that 4,000, more than 4,000 rockets were fired at civilians in Israel, not only Israeli uh, Jews, but all the people, citizens in Palestine. Not one word was said. The Honorable President yesterday in France spoke and he said, we side with the Palestinians. Our, su our support as a country for Palestine is based on principle. And then he said, we are prepared to play a role through which we could help the two sides to get together. Honorable Minister and President Ramaphosa, you should understand that South Africa has zero influence or credibility in the Palestine-Israel conflict. Israel is not the former new national party. They don't have a death wish. They do not plan to commit suicide or they don't want to surrender. Remember Masada. So if you understand that, therefore, don't expect any call soon from the Middle East for South Africa to mediate. We have destroyed, we've got no credibility whatsoever. You have sided. Thank you very much, honorable member. You have sided with Palestine and you do not recognize the right of Israel to Thank exist. Thank you very much. Your time is now up. Thank you. Uh, who has been making that noise? I couldn't see. Please uh, refrain from doing that. Please kick her off. I, unfortunately, I'll, I'll ask, the, I have to warn the person first, so I didn't see the name appearing. I'm sorry. Uh, but I think the table staff can assist me. Don't repeat. Um, as we proceed, we now invite the Deputy Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Buotas. Honorable House Chair, Honorable Barotta, Minister of Terco, Dr. Pando, 
Deputy Minister Maseh Lamini, Chair of the PC, Honorable Mahmoud Basala, Honorable Members, Diplomatic Community. The values that uh, inspire and guide South Africa as a nation uh, are those that we, we accumulated during decades of struggle for liberation. And we, Honorable House Chair, were a beneficiary of many acts of selfless solidarity in the past. And therefore, South Africa believes what it wishes for its own people is what is wished for the rest of the world. As we build back better, our foreign policy therefore draws on the spirit of internationalism and is intertwined with our pursuit of a better Africa in a better world. As we celebrate 27 years of freedom, as a generation, we should always be conscious that there is a dialectical relationship between our 27 years of freedom and the 27 years of imprisonment, which sought to break the resilient spirit of Nelson Mandela. As we celebrate the silver jubilee of South Africa's constitution, we are conscious that the constitutional values embedded in the Bill of Rights should be reflected in the outlook of our foreign policy disposition. It therefore holds, Honorable Chairperson, that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestine people, quote unquote, Nelson Mandela. It therefore holds that the global solidarity and the deepening of South to South cooperation becomes an important attribute in our foreign policy repository. Honorable Chair, today heralds 119 years of independence of Cuba from the Spanish Empire and the end of the first US military occupation on 20 May 1902. Cuba remains a site of struggle. It remains a country on which South Africa draws leaves. We regret, therefore, the continued and unilateral sanctions against Cuba and will continue to support the annual resolutions at UNGA on the necessity of ending the economic, commercial, and financial blockade against Cuba. That includes, Honorable House Chairs, the, the Helms Burton Title III Extraterritorial Act, and it's, and it's a resolution which will receive South Africa's unequivocal report, support. We trust, however, Chair, that the leadership of President Biden will be inspired by the foreign policy initiative of 2015 of President Barack Obama, which authorized a process of back-channel negotiations and normalized diplomatic relations with Cuba. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, the Cuban people and the Henry Reeves International Medical Brigade have been an instrumental combination of young people, which is firmly embedded within Solidarity Mantra. Even before the pandemic began, Cuban doctors and health professionals were already providing medical support in 59 of the, of the countries in the world. As we build better, Chair, we must reiterate our unwavering support for the people of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and called on the USA to consider its stance on Venezuela in light of the report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Chances and Human Rights, Ms. Dohan, who published her initial recommendations calling for the lifting of unilateral coercive measures. Within the Western Hemisphere, the Americas and the Caribbeans span a vast geographical area, which include developed countries, developing countries, and least developing economies. I must confirm, Honorable House Chair, that the USA is a strategic partner for South Africa and our bilateral relations continue to grow. We are pleased, therefore, to note that the new administration under the leadership of President Joe Biden has taken steps to return to the multilateral fall by rejoining the Paris Climate Accord and the WHO and a leadership on negating the matter of vaccine nationalism. The USA and South Africa have quite extensive relations, focusing in particular around areas of health, education, and science. And I think this house should note that the PEFACA allocation by the USA still amounts to 465 million US dollar, and the ACOA agreement continues to facilitate state trade, amounting to 173 uh, billion rand. Chair, the African diaspora and the Americas, particularly in the Caribbeans, continue to be a significant uh, light for South Africa, given its historical support for our struggle. Pan-Africanism therefore remains an important cornerstone of our foreign policy uh, dispensation. As we speak about Canada, Chairperson, uh, we are depositing a recognition that Canada have been instrumental 
in constructing this developmental state and will continue to draw in our bilateral relations inspiration from the Canadian uh, uh, people for the construction of a capable and a developmental state, as well as our uh, the flagship gender empowerment programs and social cohesion. Chair S. Dirko will continue to work to promote trade in the Latin America, presented by the SACO and MACUSA Preferential Trade Agreement and the AECFTA, as well as continue to work with G20 countries in Latin America, such as Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. We congratulate, of course, Chairperson Mexico for her re-election to the UN Security Council and will continue to work with Mexico to advance at a multilateral level the implementation of UN Security Council resolution, amongst others, 1325 on women, peace, and security in the UN reform. The countries of Western Europe, Chair, is well placed to support South Africa post post-COVID-19 economic uh, recovery. This applies in particular how South Africa are able to harness the South Africa-EU strategic partnership agreement, which is pivotal if we wish to reimagine a post-COVID-19 uh, dispensation. It is evident, Chairperson, that this type of partnership will be able to contribute significantly towards the presidential 100 billion US dollar investment initiative. House Chair, the new South Africa EU multi-annual indicator program for a period 2021 to 2028, which will be under the EU's newly created Neighborhood Development and International Cooperation Instrument. We hope that South Africa will be key and critical as the EU reimagine uh, itself up until the period of 2028. South Africa's trade relations will, with the UK will continue to deepen under the chairperson and remain unchanged after the UK left the, the European Union, uh, categorized as the Brexit exit. Chair, as it relates to our comprehensive strategic partnership with the Russian Federation, it resonates quite well with the priorities of the economic reconstruction and development plan. This includes the possibilities at the bilateral level for industrialization through localization, the strengthening of agricultural and food security partnership, and of course, chairperson, the energy security issues. This will be pursued in, in earnest, and we prepare. We are preparing to host the 16 South Africa Russia Intergovernmental Trade and Economic Committee, the ITEC, uh, later this year. We also, as South Africa, look forward to consolidate our strategic partnership with Turkey, with a view to host the inaugural South Africa Turkey BNC in the near future. Chairperson, this House should note that South Africa's relationship with the Organization of Africa, Caribbean, and Specific States, the old ACP, has undergone some reimagination. Most importantly, Chairperson, countries from Africa, the Caribbean, and specifically, jointly would be able to recalibrate its a, approach towards global governance, multilateralism, and international partnership as it relates to meeting the goals of the MDG. Chairperson, as I conclude, as we build better, this year marks the 60th anniversary of the Non-Aligned Movement. And the Non-Aligned Movement, Honorable Chairperson, is a structure that steeps deep in the root of struggle and of solidarity. It will be Africa's turn to chair the Non-Aligned Movement in 2022. And in this regard, Uganda has been endorsed as the incoming chair of NAM. And it's expected that the 19th summit of NAM will take place in Kampala, Uganda in 2022. The AU team of the year for the year 2021 was developed by the AU policy organs as arts, culture, and heritage levels for building the Africa we won. Mom Charlotte McClurke posed that, and I quote, cultural texts are necessarily ambitious sites in the struggle to confer power over life experience, and that we need leaders who will humble themselves so that the nation may lift them up to be the stars of Africa for future generation. Unquote. We thank President Ramaphosa as the custodian of the South Africa's foreign policy and constitutional persona, and to Dr. Pando, the Minister of Derko, for meritorious stewardship in providing leadership to the rest of the world and Africa. We continue to build better. Thank you very much, Honorable Borod. 
Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Goddess. You are proudly South African. I like your brooch and your tie. <laughs> yes, and the, this label also. Uh... Thank you, and your background too. Thank you. Uh, we proceed as I invite my colleague, the Honorable uh, Tassa, uh, to, 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 to take over. I call on the Honorable Mpanza. Malibongwe. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, House Chairperson. Uh, greetings uh, to the Minister and the two Deputy Ministers, uh, the Portfolio Committee uh, Chairperson, Honorable uh, Tandi Mahambishlala, and the rest of uh, the members of the Portfolio Committee on International Relations and Cooperation. Achievements of South Africa's foreign policy since 1994, when the ANC came into power, have enhanced its stature as a member of international community. This have boosted its political influence and increasing its economic standing to the point of being regarded as a globally significant emerging economy. There is a link between South Africa's national interest and Africa's stability, unity, and prosperity. The department should continue placing the advancement of, Af of the African agenda at the center of our foreign policy trajectory. We note with gratitude that the department has considerable success in promoting the interest of Africa in different forums. We have noted that South Africa would continue to promote peace and stability on the continent through preventative diplomacy, peacemaking, peace building, and peacekeeping efforts. We commend the department for ensuring that South Africa remains a power broker for several conflicts in the sub-region and on the continent. It continues to participate as a troop contributing country to AU and UN authorized peacekeeping missions, also being the largest contributor to AU budget and top African contributor to the UN budget. The committee has noted that, that South Africa is generally accepted on the continent and around the globe as an influential state and is the only African country in the G20 and BRICS, as well as being one of the top 10 strategic partners of the EU. The department should ensure that South Africa Africa continues placing the African continent and the global South on the agenda of BRICS to synchronize policies such as 2063 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It has been reported in the APP that the continent has witnessed increasing sustainable economic development. This was said to be so, despite remaining pockets of instability and insecurity mainly due to intrastate conflict on the continent. We urge the department to channel its engagement in the continent to the fact that increased growth would be possible if the drivers of growth could change. In our view, manufacturing, infrastructure, development, telecommunications, energy, transport, logistics, and technology are sectors that have huge investment potential for the continent. The agricultural center, sector also has the potential to become a driver of economic growth. Against this background, the department should continue enhancing regional integration with increased and balanced trade within the South African development community and on the continent. This would be achieved through supporting the implementation of the African continental free trade area agreement and promoting greater peace, security, and stability on the continent. We view the establishment of the continental free trade area, which entered into force on May 2019 as a key priority of Africa's 2063 and a flagship project for the continent. The department should ensure the implementation of the African continental free trade area for the prosperity of South Africa, the region and the continent. The committee 
note that there is an increase on the budget allocation for capital projects. However, the committee notes further the identified state-owned properties for repairs would be used would be for those that are still occupied. And mostly these properties are in Europe. We urge the department to prioritize those in Africa in line with our foreign policy. In conclusion, honorable minister, the intended re reduction of missions should not impact on South Africa's missions in Africa. Infrastructure projects plan should prioritize missions in Africa. Land parcels and state owned properties are brought donated by friendly countries should be given the necessary attention and put back to a state where they can be used to accommodate officials and chancellors abroad, uh, especially in Africa. Our clarion call uh, as South Africa is that uh, South Africa and Africa in general would not be free or enjoy its freedom until Cuba uh, is free. South Africa would not enjoy its freedom until the people of the Western Sahara. South Africa would not enjoy its freedom until the Palestinian people are free. I thank you, House Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, can I now call upon the UDM? UDM, can I call upon ATM? I now call upon Honorable Swartz of the ANC. Over to you, Thank Honorable Swartz. Thank you, House Chair. House Chair, the ANC 2019 election manifesto has reaffirmed the priority of building a better Africa and a better world. The priority was further outlined in the medium-term expenditure framework adopted by government as the seventh one. Furthermore, in his State of the Nation address, President Ramaphosa elaborated on this priority as one of the key deliverables of government in this financial year and beyond. The advancement of our foreign policy objectives in general and the achievement of this seven priority of government specifically requires a department with requisite skills and capacity to operate in a dynamic and complex international environment. Therefore, a dynamic, agile, and capable human resource at the disposal of the department is imperative to achieve South Africa's national interest. As a committee, we have noted that due to the ceiling imposed on the compensation of employees, the department is not able to fill vacancies to replace the employees who leave the department due to old age and other natural attrition factors. We are therefore supporting the minister in her attempt to review the department's organizational structure to re reposition it in line with the available resources without compromising delivery of its mandate. The reality is that DERCO is one of the departments that are highly human resource intensive. It is against this background that the portfolio committee has urged the department to expedite finalization of review of the departmental organizational structure and prioritize the filling of critical posts aligned to the implementation of the Foreign Service Act that was passed by Parliament at the beginning of the sixth administration. Honorable members, we have been briefed during the tabling of the department's revised strategic plan and the annual performance plan that the department has undertaken to build a modern effective department with capable skilled employees that is committed to the excellent execution of South Africa's foreign policy. With the Diplomatic Academy being centered central in creating a foreign service training for a capable foreign service. The department should not dare fail in this noble objective. House Chair, in our engagements with the department, 
There are a number of recommendations which we have made for the department to implement. This include, amongst others, the implementation of effective financial management through the application of sound financial management systems, including management and financial accounting, as well as supply chain management. We are alive to the reality that this budget vote and the budget in general is presented under very difficult socioeconomic situations both in our country and over the world. In this case, we acknowledge the inevitable reprioritization within the budget. We reiterate the view of the portfolio committee. The committee was encouraged by the department's commitment and resolve to achieve its strategic objectives, albeit within the budget budgetary constraints. We further acknowledge that the budget would still be further affected by the imminent foreign exchange currency fluctuations and unavoidable and unforeseen mandates and responsibilities in its diplomatic endeavors and conduct of international relations. In conclusion, House Chair would like to urge the department to continue improving its internal controls, its audit outcome following its achievement to have a credible asset register in the last financial year. In addition, we implore the department to implement consequence management in incidences where there were financial misconduct cases and matters related to maladministration. I submit that the ANC support the budget vote six of the Department of International Relations and Corporations. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, can I now call on the Deputy Minister, the uh, Honorable Masha Hozamini. Deputy Thank you Minister. Very much. Uh, thank you very much, House Chair. Thank you very much, House Chair. Minister Pando, Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, Honorable Mohamed Sala, Honorable Members, Ladies and Gentlemen, Honorable House Chair. During this financial year, the department will focus on the following objectives in line with the government, with the government medium term strategic framework for 2019-2024. Increase foreign direct investment into South Africa and Africa. Improve South Africa access to foreign, foreign markets. Contribute to increase tourism arrivals to South Africa and improve investor confidence. In our five-year strategic plan, we have said that we are striving towards a united and a political cohesive continent that works towards shared prosperity and sustainable development, enhanced regional integration with increased and balanced trade within SADC and on the continent by supporting the creation of the African continental free trade area, promotion of peace, security, and stability, on the continent and using South Africans membership and engagement in various international forums to advance the African agenda. We are pursuing these objectives in a global environment that continues to grapple with the effect of COVID-19. We are making use of innovative ways such as digital diplomacy to achieve our objectives within the global environment that continues to to grapple with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. I have taken serious note of the audit opinion presented by the Office of the Auditor General on the department, and we are attending to the matters raised. For example, we are working on a property management strategy to move away from rentals to developing properties on state-owned land for our missions abroad and the residents of our diplomats. Honorable House Chair, in his first speech of, to the United Nations as president of the Free and Democratic South Africa, delivered in October 1994, President Nelson Mandela said, I quote, South Africa will help to create for themselves and all humanity a common world of peace and prosperity, close quote. This is a mission we continue to pursue, especially on our continent. 
In our own neighborhood, we continue to focus not only on the situation in Mozambique, as alluded by our minister, but we also remain seized with a political security situation in the kingdom of Lesotho. We cannot overemphasize the importance of a stable, secure, and prosperous Lesotho. It is our mutual interest as South Africans and Basotho that our neighborhood is safe and secure. You will recall that His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, in his capacity as SADC facilitator to the Kingdom of Lesotho, appointed a facilitation team led by retired Deputy Chief Justice Dihang Moseneka, assisted by three deputy ministers to support him in his facilitation in the Kingdom of Lesotho, as per the decision of the SADC Double Trocker Summit held in Lusaka, Republic of Angola in April 2018. The 40th Ordinary SADC Summit of Head of State and Government held virtually on the 17th August 2020, decided that the role of the SADC facilitator, His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa, should continue. The summit also recognized the important role played by the SADC facilitation team to the Kingdom of Lesotho, leading to the inauguration of the National Reforms Authority on the 6th of February 2020, which will manage, coordinate, and lead the national reform process from October 2020 until September 2021, with a possible extension until April 2022, if circumstances required. The latest visit by the SADC facilitation team to Maseru in the Kingdom of Lesotho took place from the 11th to 13th March this year, the objectives of the visit to Maseru was to receive a status update on the implementation of the reform process since the last visit in October 2020. The current mandate of the SADC facilitation team to the Kingdom of Lesotho is valid until the next SADC ordinary summit of head of state and government in August 2021, where the facilitator is required to report on the status on these processes. Honorable Chair, in July, the Republic of South Sudan will mark 10 years of its existence. South Africa enjoys cordially bilateral relations with South Sudan, and the two countries have a long-standing historical relationship that predates South Sudan's independence from the Republic of Sudan in July 2011. An agreement established official bilateral relations was signed in September 2012. In 2019, South Africa committed to provide humanitarian assistance to the Republic of South Sudan through the African Renaissance Fund in the form of food aid and medical supplies. These initiatives were intended to address social economic challenges facing vulnerable communities, including the refugees and internal displaced persons comprising mainly of women and children who were negatively affected by the conflict in South Sudan. The last intervention we made was to send a consignment of food items donated by the South African government to the people of South Sudan. This humanitarian aid package formed part of a series of other interventions by South Africa towards elevating the humanitarian challenges facing the people of South Sudan. At the quest of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, Honorable David Mabuza, Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, in his capacity as the Presidential Special Envoy to the Republic of South Sudan, was invited to facilitate a series of meetings between the parties to the revitalized agreement on the, res on the resolution of conflict in the Republic of South Sudan to resolve the impasses. His mediation efforts significantly contributed towards an amicable political settlement among the signatories to the revitalized agreement on the resolution of conflict in the Republic of South Sudan. On the 22nd February 2020, the parties of the revitalized agreement on the resolution on conflict in the Republic of South Sudan reached an agreement which paved the way for the establishment of, a, of the revitalized transitional government of national unity. On the 22nd February this year, the country marks the first anniversary of the revitalized traditional government of national unity. 
Honorable Chair, the Middle East region is very important economically. Our trade with the Middle East for 2020 amounts to 122 billion. There has been export growth in a number of key areas, particularly in, agriculture, in agricultural products such as live animals, citrus, nuts, and vegetables. We are also exporting precious metals, iron, steel, aircrafts, and machinery to a number of countries in this region. South Africa is intensifying its economic diplomacy effort, and we are looking at some of the economies that continue to grow despite the difficulties associated with COVID-19. Some of these are found in Asia. South Africa's bilateral trade with India amounting to 108.7 billion in 2020. There are more than 130 Indian companies present in South Africa. Our strategic partnership has important dimensions beyond the bilateral facets and also relates to multilateral institutions of which both countries are members. These institutions include the G20, BRICS, and IPSA. Honorable Chair, I wish to conclude by appraising Parliament on the important work that the department does to provide assistance to the South Africans in distress abroad. Following the rapid spread of the COVID-19 pandemic earlier last year, we set up a consular incident, incident uh, command center in order to facilitate assistance to South African citizens who found themselves stranded abroad due to unforeseen circumstances and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And the other instance was during the insurgent attack in Mozambique. During the 2020-2021 financial year, the total number of consular cases attended to were approximately 700. In dealing with South African citizens in distress abroad, it became evident that the concept of consular services was misunderstood by the South African society. And many of our citizens are, are unfamiliar with the nature of assistance they can expect when stranded, destitute and distressed abroad has the ongoing need to encompass this consular awareness campaign, especially for citizens traveling abroad. The department has created an application for South Africa for South Africans to register themselves during a major disaster, be it natural or man-made, so that an accurate database of South African citizens globally can be maintained. This database will assist the expedient, the process and time to render consular assistance to our citizens abroad. The training phase of this application will commence during the course of this current financial year. These are some of the measures to ensure that we remain of service to South African citizens wherever they find themselves in the world. Finally, Chair, let me say that South Africa is committed to remain an influential actor and partner on the international stage while effectively contributing to the delivery of the country's domestic priority and advancement of the African agenda. I call this house to adopt the budget of this department. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. Can I now call upon Honorable Chetty of the DA? Thank you, Chair. Greetings to the Minister, Deputy Ministers, Chair of the Portfolio Committee, fellow members. Minister Pando, your statement during your recent interview with ENCA, all corrupt ANC officials must go to jail. Two discrepancies caught my eye. Firstly, what about the corrupt ANC politicians? Surely they should also go to jail as well. And secondly, allow me to correct you. As you were quoted, it's not that President Ramaphosa is trying to address the absence of ethics and integrity in the country, but the absence of ethics and integrity within your ANC. Also, you further stated that the president as resolute in his intention to address malfeasance prevalent in our country. Again, it's not to address malfeasance prevalent in our country, but within your ANC. This corruption and corrupt officials you speak about is not a South African problem, Minister. It's an ANC problem. 
Minister Pando talk is cheap, yet fail to take action when their behavior tantamount to insubordination of the current suspended DELCO CFO, Kaifu Zamashu, which was reported to you in 2019 after his inappropriate behavior, where he lied to the portfolio committee and dismissed staff members before they could appear before the committee. It was only after the Democratic Alliance had placed pressure on you, you succumbed and suspended the CFO two months ago. Also, Minister, after continued pressure from the Democratic Alliance regarding the highly controversial 118 million rand New York pilot project, you have suspended other senior officials. And Minister, contrary to your opening statement, no one has been charged in your department for this fruitless and wasteful expenditure as exposed by the Auditor General in 2016. Clearly, Minister, you are not stepping aside by sidestepping the issues. Furthermore, the DA is now vindicated in our call that the appointment of ambassadors should be the responsibility of Parliament and not the President. The Zondo Commission has exposed the flaws and concerns raised by the Democratic Alliance as the President uses this power to dispense political patronage and retirement packages for embarrassed or disgraced comrades. Specific mention was made of the ambassadorship appointment of the disgraced Bruce Colleoni, who immediately after the international embarrassing Gupta's battle crew of Saga, he was appointed as an ambassador to Denmark. Once again, Minister, you failed to act and act decisively when the portfolio committee recommended in a support adopted by this parliament to suspend ambassador Jerry Machida for his misconduct, we incidentally, was also appointed as the ambassador to New York immediately after the 180 million New York pilot project debacle in 2016. This is yet another act of dispensing political patronage to comrades minister. Clearly, there must be some truth in the Zondo Commission's allegations that ambassadors donate a portion of their salaries to the ANC, not as a donation as implied by the president during his governing session at the Zondo Commission recently but as payback to the ANC for this lucrative deployment. The law-abiding South African citizens are sick and tired of your corrupt ANC and the abuse by senior politicians and officials who through the ANC Cater Department Committee have plundered the coffers of our country. Minister, this time round, not even your fancy Queen's English will be able to allow you to spin the corrupt antics of your corrupt ANC from deceiving the South African public and the international world anymore. And at the polls on the 27th of October, the South African public will punish your ANC at the ballot boxes and vote for change to save South Africa from this corrupt ANC. I thank you. Honorable member, can I now call upon Honorable Nkosi from the ANC? Thank you, Chairperson of the session. Chair, our democracy is defined by the principles of representative and participatory democracy. The legitimacy of our policies is enhanced by ownership and participation of members of the public, both in the formulation of and execution of policy. This is consistent with the nature and character of the ANC, which at all times engages with society in formulating its policies as well as implementation. The principle of Batupil ensures that at the center of any development, the people are the driving force and that the terms of reference of anything that we do resonates with them. An effective public policy provides the groundwork necessary to forge links between the state and society for, in order to legitimize the acceptance of the country's foreign policy and its actions. Public diplomacy further includes the communication of our policy, its priorities, objectives, through direct and indirect communication using various media platforms, including face-to-face -face communication and new social media. In what is an all-inclusive, transparent, and consistent targeting of local and international audiences with a view of shaping debate and understanding of our policies and our role at an international level, including in economic relations. DECO continues to work towards an increased understanding of South Africa's foreign policy engagements by both local and international audiences. 
We use various, the department uses various platforms to involve the public, including through engaging political office bearers and in media briefings. Our communication of these policies is further enhanced by foreign policy think tanks who provide both critical analysis and assessment of our foreign policies, as well as new knowledge on international relations, which may, on one way or the other, influence the state in executing policy. The department also offers protocol services on a continuous basis to facilitate the arrival and departure of dignitaries through the state protocol services. DECO rendered consular assistance to South Africans traveling, working, studying, and living abroad. Since the advent of COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent nationwide lockdown, the department has continued to provide consular assistance to South African citizens abroad, who due to unforeseen circumstances and events became stranded, distressed, and even destitute as a result of the pandemic and the global lockdowns that were to follow. <clears throat> this consular support is provided to South African citizens even during any other time they require that support despite it or whether or not there is COVID. In the recent past, we have witnessed how our consular support, especially in the US, assisted with the repatriation of one of our compatriots who lost his life tragically in the United States, allegedly in the hands of police. We take this opportunity to send our heartfelt condolences to the family of Mr. Mien. We commend the role played by our ambassadors and consular services to ensure a dignified return of the remains of Mr. Mieni to his family and to the, his beloved ones. Notwithstanding a marginal decrease in the allocation to the program, public diplomacy, which may largely be due to COVID-19 health protocols, which discourage face-to-face -face interactions, we believe that the department will find alternative ways of engaging with both local and international audiences to communicate our foreign policy priorities in this term. This may include utilization of what is seen or termed the digital diplomacy that we are beginning to enter into. We urge South Africans to take serious interest in the trajectory that our country is taking in international political environment. The ANC supports budget vote six and DECO. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, honorable member. Can I now call upon COPE? Uh, COPE. Then we call honorable Hendricks of uh, Al Jama. Honorable Thank Hendricks. You. Thank you, honorable House Chair. The cabinet has issued a statement to condemn Israel. President Ramaphosa has also condemned Israel in a special presidential statement. The Chairman of the Portfolio Committee of International Relations today has vehemently condemned Israel and called it an apartheid state. It is a revolutionary duty to support this budget. Parliament must also support the charge laid by Durko with the International Criminal Court that Israel committed a crime against humanity by killing with one strike eight children at the al sati refugee camp. Let us honor these victims, the al sati Camp 8, Suhaib Al-Hadidi, 14 years old, Yahya Al-Hadidi, 11 years old, Abdul Rahman Al-Hadidi, 8 years old, Wisham Al-Hadidi, 6 years old, Mariam Abu Hatab, 15 years old. Yasmin Abu Hatab, 5 years old. Bilal Abu Hatab, 10 years old. Yusuf Abu Hatab, 11 years old. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Can I now call upon Honorable Mashwe of the ACDP? Thank you, Chairperson. A very dangerous situation is developing in neighboring Mozambique, yet our government has said and done very little to bring peace to the area or to prepare for a possible influx of refugees 
should the situation worsen. President Ramaphosa, on the other hand, has written a letter about the current Middle East crisis. In it, he says, among others, intractable conflicts can only be solved through peaceful negotiation, but takes sides and refuse to condemn the more than 3,500 rockets that have been fired from Gaza into Israel, densely populated residential areas, to maim and kill as many innocent women and children as possible. The ACDP's condolences goes to the families of the more than 200 victims of the current violence in both Palestine and Israel. We find it hypocritical that some from the international community, including South Africa, would condemn Israel for using their air power in response to the thousands of rockets fired by Hamas and their associates into Israel. Why are they refusing to condemn Hamas for their aggression and their rockets? The ACDP condemns such hypocrisy. We would also like to affirm Israel's right to defend herself against any foreign aggression and to live within safe and secure borders. Taking the Palestinian side in the conflict will never bring peace to the Middle East. It will only prolong and increase the violence it also, yeah, and it also disqualifies South Africa from being a credible mediator in the conflict. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that nobody can succeed, can succeed to destroy Israel while the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is alive. He said that no weapon formed against Israel, his people shall prosper. The ACDP is concerned with what appears to be the department's refusal to be transparent in some matters, particularly in the New York pilot project matter. Among the findings of the Portfolio Committee's fact-finding mission to New York was that there is a strong likelihood of wrongdoing in the pilot project. Questions around the 118 million, million rents that was paid on the basis of a misrepresentation to the department have not been answered. The committee further saw a need for an investigation to determine the root causes of all the non-compliance areas around the New York pilot project. To our dismay, and while waiting for the investigation, Director General Cabo Mahuay, who was not a DG during the negotiations and payment of the 180 million rents for what was supposed to be a piece of land, was suspended by the minister. And until today, we don't know why. The ACDP will ensure that this matter will not be swept under the carpet and the DG Mahuay will not be made a scapegoat in matters of corruption. Until all questions around the New York pilot project are satisfactorily answered and that there is full transparency in DECO, the ACDP will not support budget vote six. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we now call upon Honorable Muela? From the ANC, Honorable Wella, from House the Chair. ANC. Thank you so much, House Chair. Honorable Minister, Deputy Ministers, the Chair of the Committee, all Honorable Members present here today, distinguished guests, thank you so much. Since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen many difficult events unfolding in the internal system, but few strike to the, to the heart of the progressive movement around the world, like the plight of the Palestinian people. The situation in Palestine makes us all question the significance and effectiveness of the global system of governance. The world is watching as people of Palestine enjoy a, a, a continuous onslaught by the Israel Defense Force. The question that arises, Honorable House Chair, is that how long should the people of Palestine suffer while the world watches. The Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Rian Manso, said, said it best when he asked a simple question, and I quote, where should the weak and the poor go? The UN is supposed to be the house for all people. The UN is supposed to be the house for all people. It's supposed to be the house for the vulnerable. 
he went he, and those could. He went further on to say, and I quote, if the UN cannot support the vulnerable, then what is the business of the UN, honorable members and house chair? We must not forget the words of the ambassador of Ambassador Riyad uh, Mansa when, when we reflect on the effectiveness of the United Nations. Our conviction, House Chair, is that the international cooperation should contribute to the world peace, no, the other way around. Our firm belief is that the international conflict must be resolved peacefully within the parameters of multilateralism. To this end, we are encouraged Honorable Minister, by the departmental, by departmental commitments to the following priorities, especially for Africa in the year 2020, 2021 financial year, that a united and a political cohesion continent that works towards a shared prosperity and sustainable development. And further than that, enhanced regional integration with increased and balanced trade within SADC and of the continent by supporting the creation of the African continental, continental free trade area. And again, promotion of greater peace, security, stability on the continent. And lastly, using the South African membership and engagement in various international forums to advance the African agenda. House chair, we remain committed to the Ezulini consensus, which calls for more representatives and Democratic Security Council, in which Africa, like all other world regions, is represented. Our advantage of the foreign policy objectives requires that we should form, we should form part and participate in alliance with other countries to develop a, to, to, to develop a common consensus in addressing international dispute. This also includes alliance for socio-economic issues. One of the key deliverables for this financial year will be around the participation of South Africa, uh, South African uh, Development Community, which is SADC, again, on politics, defense, and security cooperation, the Troika, as an incoming chairperson of SADC, again. Our relationship with SADC, SADC, uh, uh, with SADC form part of our commitment to the African agenda and that of the regional integration. In addition to support of the African agenda, we continue to advocate to, for, for the strengthening of South Africa cooperation and in our, in our approach to international po uh, politics. Uh, we also strive for strengthening and maintaining uh, 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 of, of North-South cooperation. This represents an aspiration on our house chair of the reality of the global uh, politics and is in line with the committee's view that South Africa should maintain relations with Global South and maintain historical relations with countries of the North. It is understandable that the work of the department with regard to with regards to its international cooperation continues to continues to be affected by the global pandemic, honorable minister and other honorable members. However, the use of digital diplomacy has ensured that international cooperation in continues continues to be advanced through te 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 technological platform. The portfolio committee has affirmed that the partnership such as IPSA, IORA and BRICS remains relevant to the international interests of South Africa and African agenda. All BRICS countries are committed to BRICS Bank and South Africa and welcomes the efforts of the BRICS Bank in assisting South Africa with the impact of COVID-19. To conclude on our house chair, we wish to reiterate our view that the department enhances uh, enhance the management of its asset to its contribute to this contribution to the image of the country and as, as it pursues its national interest. Furthermore, the department must address its administrative challenge in ensuring that it is able to effectively achieve its mandate. I just want to remind uh, my fellow honorable member, honorable Chetty, that today maybe he's lost. Today we are debating the budget vote for vote six. We're not debating something else like probably uh, you have listened to the minister today while, he was, while she was addressing the media today. So today you are totally lost, honorable Chetty. We're debating uh, the, the budget vote six 
of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation. Therefore, as such, the African National Congress support the budget vote six of the Department of International, of International Relations and Cooperation. Thank you so much, House Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, can we now call upon Honorable Bosheik Imam? Thank you very much, NFC. Chairperson. Chairperson, uh, 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 the National Freedom Party supports your budget vote. Chairperson, I have a very simple message today, and particularly to the rogue state of apartheid Zionist Israel and the rogue elements of the Democratic Alliance Freedom Front, and of course the ACDP who will sell his soul just to maintain some level of relevance in society. Palestine shall be free. Palestine will be free. Free Palestine, free Palestine, free Palestine. Free Palestine, free Palestine, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free, Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free, Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free, Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free, Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free. Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, free, free Palestine. Palestine shall be free. Palestine will be free. Free, free Palestine, 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 long live the people of Palestine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Can we now call upon Honorable Faber from the DA? Uh, honorable member from the DA. Thanks you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, members. Now, let us look at how we are doing so far under the ANC government during the last few years. President Thabo Mbeki's African Renaissance Fund was a call for economical regeneration of the African continent by providing humanitarian assistance to struggling countries. This African Renaissance Fund now became an open wallet for Durko, paid for you, or paid by, for, by the South African taxpayer. A few years ago, an internal audit found 530 million had been irregularly spent. NEPAT provided information showing that more than 770 million of South Africa's state fund has been used to prop up rogue states and countries and had a history of human rights abuse or non-democratically elected governments. While Zimbabwe received 600 million from the ARF fund, even though the committee at that time had heard that SA did not even track how this fund was spent. Now, for those of you who don't know yet, Cuba is also part of the African continent. Yes, you heard me correctly. It's the only country outside Africa who also benefits from this ARF fund. Our Minister of Finance, Tipu Mbeweni, made it very clear in his budget speech this year that we owe a lot of people a lot of money that we don't have. But during this time, when South Africa is borrowing money from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to respond to the fight against the COVID pandemic, 
It at the same time makes generous donations for medical material supplies with tens of millions of rands to the Cuban government. The African Renaissance Funds recently also made available a loan package to Cuba of $140 million. This is just over 2 billion rand. The history of Cuba comes a long way since, as in 2010, a debt of 1.1 billion rand owed by Cuba to South Africa for diesel engines bought was just scrapped and cancelled. The ANC government also bought in doctors and engineers from Cuba. While we have enough health workers and qualified engineers ourselves, unemployed, sitting at home, is this ANC government looking at the interest of our people first? Obviously not. I believe that the ARF fund should be put directly under Treasury to stop abusing taxpayers' money and for now rather look at South Africans' health first by providing enough COVID vaccines in time to our own citizens. And in conclusion, the chaos in the ANC is affecting our country to the point of no return. The Secretary General of the ANC, Ace Magashule, has put South Africa in an international predicament by maintaining that he suspended the President of South Africa. And now it becomes clearer every day that the ANC government should use their own step aside clause and step aside to let the DA govern well. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. Can we now call upon Honorable Nola of the ANC? Thank you very much, uh, House Chair, uh, the members of the executive, uh, members of the portfolio committee, officials of the department, honorable members. Good afternoon in this uh, budget vote debate. The value of any budget allocation is not only on the amount of money allocated, but also on how the funds are disbursed and utilized. We often talk of the concept of value for money. Budget allocation are as good as how they are managed and utilized. The main objective of the Public Finance Management Act is to regulate financial management in the national government and provincial governments to ensure that all revenue expenditure assets and liabilities of those governments are managed efficiently and effectively to provide for the responsibilities of persons entrusted with financial management in those governments. The Auditor, the Auditor General further recommends that all role players in national and provincial government should continue to work together to strengthen the capacity processes and controls of departments and public entities, which will enable credible financial and performance reporting, compliance with key legislation, sound financial management and delivery of services. Sound financial planning and management for any business or any state entity is more than just keeping an accurate set of books or balancing your double entry accounts to zero. Finance is the lifeline of a business or, in, or state institution. So any state institution that mismanages its financial aspects has no chance of standing over the long haul. Sound financial management involves a deliberate and consistent control of all incomes, expenditures, assets, and liabilities to ensure not only the sustainability and profitability, but also the efficiency of the state institution. As a portfolio committee, we have engaged with the department in our budget review recommendations report on matters relating to irregular expenditure, unauthorized expenditure, as well as fruitless and wasteful expenditure. The department has provided account on gaps with regard to areas which require tighter financial controls. Welcome the fact that investigations are undertaken on incidences of financial irregularities. As part of interventions by the department, as a portfolio committee, we have made a number of recommendations to which, recommendations to which the department committed to implement to ensure sound financial management. Amongst these recommendations includes the need to maintain the standard of unqualified opinion on performance reporting and apply the strategies to use the strategies used to improve the financial reporting. Immediately, conduct a forensic investigation into unexplained transactions totaling and report to the committee on the findings, recommendations, and implementation thereof to consider approaching the Office of the Accountant General and the National Chair Treasurer, to conduct a thorough competence assessment of the finance function, as well as provide support to the identified skills deficiencies in the finance branch, to recruit new employees, including qualified accountants, including personnel 
accredited by the Institute of Chartered Accountants in the near future or through other means to conduct a skills audit in the finance branch to determine whether there is an appropriate capacity to compensate the branch accordingly to address the root causes of recruiting qualified audit opinions. We are emphasizing these recommendations because they will remain part of our focus in this financial year through our oversight role on the department. We are doing this to ensure that there are no leakages in the system which may deprive provision of service, services to our people. The incentive supports this uh, budget vote, uh, Honorable House Chair. Indeed, uh, let me follow from uh, Honorable Moela. Not only Honorable Chetty that was out of tune, uh, Honorable Feber just uh, before me just came here and said nothing. But we are not surprised because they are following the tune of their bosses which is uh, John Stainerson, the most illiterate and confused man in the world. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, can we now call upon the Minister for International Relations and Cooperation, Honorable Pando? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. I wish to thank all honorable members that have made a contribution to the debate. In particular, I want to thank the honorable Maham Bisala for her leadership of the portfolio committee and the advice that she constantly provides both to the ministry and the department alongside very robust oversight. We are working hard, uh, Chairperson, to finalize all regulations and directives, read the Foreign Service Act, as highlighted by Chairperson Maham Bitlala. We are also redrafting the SADPA bill in order to address concerns that had been raised by cabinet with the original draft bill. We certainly confirm to all members who raised this matter that no closure of a mission in Africa is currently in our plans. I'm choosing my words carefully, Chairperson, because situations of financial uh, uh, constraints may change from time to time. And so while uh, Africa remains uh, fully covered by us, I'm saying currently there is no plan to close any embassy on the continent. We do support the objectives that the Honorable Chair referred to, including continuing to work on the Security Council reform agenda, despite the massive uh, resistance uh, that I referred to. I wish to repeat, Honorable Chairperson, that South Africa's government, the African National Pol Congress, in its policies, have always supported a two-state solution in the Middle East challenge that all of us have referred to today. We will not desert Palestine, nor their search for freedom. This does not in any way have an anti-Semitic intention of creating an impression that we are against the existence of the, sta on the state of the state of Israel. And so Honorable Mishwe and his new friends are totally mistaken in their view that we do not hold to a two-state solution. We held to it before they entered politics. We will still be holding to it when they've exited politics. Chairperson, I also wish to welcome the remarks made by the Honorable Mpanza, particularly his reiteration of the important need to ensure we focus on productive capacity in Africa, on digitalization, on modernizing agriculture and growing it for agro-processing and export, and ensuring that the Free Trade Act is utilized for expanding African growth. I do confirm to the Honorable Mbanza that the property management portfolio is being attended to and that we will take the steps that he and the chairperson, Honorable Swartz and other members have referred to, including Honorable Mulder, on ensuring uh, that we reduce the funding that we are di uh, directing toward rental costs and indeed, I agree with the Honorable Mulder that those members of the department who incur costs through damage to property uh, for the department should in future 
be responsible and be the ones who pay such costs. We are amending uh, our rules in this regard to ensure that the responsible party bears that particular type of cost. We also, of course, continue to be committed to the freedom of the people of Western Sahara, their self-determination, which they have fought for so hard. I thank the honorable voters, particularly for the attention to the regions he referred to that he gives in the work that he has been assigned, the work with Cuba, with Venezuela, his work in the non-aligned movement, the important contributions he has made as we seek to reform the old ACP into a new body more responsive to development priorities. And uh, I'm so grateful that uh, Honorable Botus reiterated the AU theme of 2021 because it resonates with our focus on culture and heritage that we wish to strengthen and endorse. I thank Deputy Minister Mashiko Dlamini for the hard work she does in support of the Deputy President as envoy of the President to South Sudan. As I have seen her dancing as the humanitarian aid arrived, I thank her for the support to the facilitator in Lesotho and all the work she does to support us in our African agenda. I wish to uh, really thank uh, all the speakers of the African National Congress for their important contributions. And I thank Honorable Swartz in particular for recognizing that we are working hard to review our organizational structure. It's not easy to try to balance costs alongside retaining your staff and in particular, strengthening your talent uh, pool. We will report to the portfolio committee as we finalize this work. We also do agree that uh, Honorable Chetty has clearly uh, watched a very old uh, interview and because he didn't have much to contribute, he had to use it here, including uh, directing some pointed insults to me. Uh, unfortunately, I do know that an insult is the last refuge of a scoundrel and so I will not take his remarks seriously. I do, however, uh, thank the Honorable Bergman for uh, commenting and affirming that uh, the DA is committed to a two-state solution. Uh, we are consistent in our approach and we do pay attention to Zimbabwe. We have made clear statements on the suffering of the Rohingya and objected to the coup in Myanmar. So we don't reserve ourselves to one part of the world. We are attentive to all international issues. I thank the Honorable Tlengwa and assure him that the France summit achieved commitment that the special drawing rights we've been calling for of the reserve in the International Monetary Fund was agreed upon. And this is something that will assist Africa to have resources, Your particularly the poorest, least developed countries on the continent to have resources to revive yeah. their economies. In conclusion, Chairperson, yeah. let me thank each of the members who indicated yeah. support for the budget vote. And I also thank the Honorable Msani for her comments and assure her that there is no intention at this moment to appoint an ambassador to Israel after we withdrew our ambassador in 2019. I thank you. Honorable Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Members. Uh, that concludes the mini plenary. Uh, the mini plenary will now rise. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson.